Welcome to the February meeting of the Terrell County Board of Education. At this moment, we are going to observe a moment of silence. Thank you. At this time, we're going to stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance. As a general rule, the board delays discussion and or decision until a later time. Since this is the only time on the agenda that the audience may participate in the board's meeting, if any person wishes to address the board, she or he should make a note at this time. Please remember that no person addressing the board may refer to a student or employee by name as they are protected by law from such and may only be discussed in closed session as governed by board policy and commonly recognized practice. I do not see a name tonight on the public forum, but if there's anyone who would like to we give the opportunity, if anybody's here would like to address. Okay, thank you. Next up is, is our special recognition for employee, staff, and students. And um, the first one we have is the employee of the month with Dr. Lynn. Good evening. 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 <laughs> uh, I'm an athlete, so I'm going to call it a trophy. That uh, this month's recipient will receive a my speech over there. But um, I wanted to recognize uh, Ms. Anna for uh, my department. Um, being the new person is challenging. Uh, moving from Georgia to North Carolina and having to move, and it was uh, it was a lot. <coughs> but I could count on one every day, or almost every day. Ms. Corbin stopping in, stopping by, asking if things were okay, um, 
checking with, and not just the general, are things, are things okay, but specific details and things that we have worked on. And uh, I know this is due, have you been able to work on this? Have you been able to find this? But she was very specific, and it, it just really um, made me feel at home, made me feel like part of the team. And the re another reason that I wanted to recognize her is that she, it wasn't just me that she seen about. Uh, it was the Clinton and all of the new people on our hall. She was there, and she made uh, she made a specific note that she considered herself a mentor, and that she knew how important mentoring was. And that really kind of accentuated for me that this is what Columbia is all about. And this is what this institution is all about. And I, I hope, well, I think, I know that this is what the district. All about. I think she really represents not only not only Columbia High School, but this district and, and just the uh, Tidal County in general. So I just want everyone to join me in recognizing Ms. Anna Alden. recognizing um, teachers, teacher assistants, and students in our exceptional children's department. Um, we believe that our department um, excels with student advocacy, meeting accommodations, meeting needs um, for all students, and behind all of that is our teachers. Um, so for this month, we have recognized Ms. Harris from middle school and she has displayed flexibility within her job role and always advocating for students like she always has her heart in um what's important for those students and i really appreciate that and i appreciate her working beside me with, um with a lot of the kind of um tough cases that we have so um i just i'm really happy to award her um the DC Teacher of the Month recognition. Student of the Month, and I called Ms. Harris and I said, Ms. Harris, do you think is most deserving of this? And Ms. Harris, without any doubt or any hesitation, said, Ms. Kamena. And so, there she is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I want to go ahead and read. I'll make sure we get appreciation. Uh, certificate of recognition, this certificate is awarded to Kamena, Renato Cincinero. <laughs> she's a DC student of the month for February 2024 for her hardworking kindness, and she is kind and very, very outgoing every day. And she engages with me and talks with me, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. 
que tiene su nombre y el premio que está recibiendo. Again, this person goes above and beyond. Um, she is willing to do whatever we, we ask of her to do. Um, sometimes I meet her on the bus parking lot and she hasn't even gotten the door and I'm like, change plans, this is what we need um, to happen today. And she, she never complains about anything that I ask her to do. And when you ask her, how are you doing? Her response is always, I'm blessed. So, without further ado, I would like to recognize Ms. Michelle Jackson as our VP today. Um, she's worked with uh, Sarah County School for almost 12 and a half years or so, yes, and she's came, come back as a um, exceptional teacher, exceptional children's teacher, as well as a bus driver. So we do appreciate you. Thank you for just going right ahead, stepping in, and just being that person that Ms. Bridges needed, that Ms. Ronnie needed, that we all needed. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Congratulations to all, and um, just as a reminder, um, if, you're, if your presentation, when you're finished with that, you're welcome to leave if you so would be inclined. You're welcome to go ahead and exit if you want. And that also goes for our staff as you present this evening. If you would like to go ahead and leave, um, we're okay with that. We'll let you know. okay. Next up is our school reports, and we have the first report is Terrell Elementary School. <coughs> Yes, please. There's a clicker up there. Do you like? Okay, yep. you're good. Right okay, here. Okay. Hold on one more second. Let me hit. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. Okay. okay. All right. So good evening. Again, I'm Mary Rogers. I'm the principal of Terrell Elementary School. Um, and so tonight, what I have for you is our data presentation um, for quarter two from our um, NC check in day or our second NC check in. Okay. So we have our school improvement goals for the 23 24 school year. I'm not going to go over these. These um, are a review for us. Um, but this is what we focus on throughout the year. We refer to these as we're going through our data um, and looking to meet our goals for the year. 
And so I don't have in-class data or I-ready data for you tonight because we are actually working on those and we just finished with our in-class assessments. Um, so we didn't have that data. So tonight what I'm going to share with you is specifically our NC check-in 2 data um, and we will look at it in comparison to the check-in 1 data. So for third grade ELA, you can see we have check-in A on the left and check-in B on the right. And so one of our strengths for third grade ELA, or actually a couple for this NC check-in, um, was language as well as reading for information. And I would also like to point out, um, we did have an increase in the overall score of the percentage of students who scored 50% or higher. For fourth grade ELA, you can see here that reading for literature um, was a strength for us, as well as um, we were still holding pretty strong with reading for information as well. Um, and the overall score is a little less than a 10 point um, difference there. So we, we count that as a strength as well. Fifth grade ELA, you can see here um, that reading for information as well as reading for literature were strengths for our fifth grade students for this um, second NC check-in, as well as that overall score of our percentage of students who scored 50% or higher. Um, that was pretty steady there as well. Looking at math for third grade, we had numbers and operations in base 10. That was a strength for us as well as operations and algebraic safety. We saw um, an increase in that. So those were the strengths for third grade math. Looking at fourth grade math, we had um, numbers and operations um, with fractions, which was a strength for us in this NC check-in too. Fifth grade math, Numbers and operations and fractions, again, was a strength for us, and that's something that I do like to point out because anybody that's been in education knows that fractions and decimals are the two things that our kids really, really struggle with. So we'll take every win we can get there. And I would also like to point out the overall score there as well with our percentage of students scoring 50% or higher was pretty um, comparable there for that last check-in. Fifth grade science, this check-in was specifically for life. And so you can see here, we had a lot of strengths um, on this NC check-in um, for, for life science. And so um, we, you know, with the exception of two standards, we, all the other standards were above 50%. So that's a huge highlight for fifth grade science. Okay. So, what are some things we've identified for strengths? So, I pointed out a few of those as we went along, but what I would like to really hone in on is our science continues to hold strong. So, we had great first um, science check-in as well as um, the second science check-in. Um, we're consistent in our reading strands across the grade levels. And I would also like to point out that we currently have a long-term sub at fifth grade. So the fact that our kids are holding strong with those um, reading strands in fifth grade is a strength for us. Um, as well as the numbers and operations base 10 in third grade and fractions in fourth and fifth grade for math. And so what have we identified that we need to improve on? Okay, so we are continuing to work in our PLCs with um, making sure that our teachers understand and unpack the standards. We are showing alignment of the standards with our assessments, okay, with our exemplars. And again, as always, we continue to have that conversation with the use of the manipulatives, right? It's not just always paper. Like, we can give students manipulatives to manipulate and come to the answer and then transfer it the other way. What are our next steps? Again, internalizing lesson plans. That is the major work of us at TES. And what that looks like is that PLC cycle protocol with the standards of packing, the lesson analysis and annotating um, in the already manuals, as well as exemplar creations, or if the exemplar is already created, we're marking it up so we know exactly what we're looking for with our students. 
support from our tutors and our MTSS coordinator, as well as small group instruction. And we will continue with our day to day and instructional plans to map out the rest of the school year. So discipline and attendance data. So we currently have had 69 office referrals for the school year. The two highest incidents for those are aggressive behavior and disruptive behavior is how they're coded. And we are currently having conferences with parents. We are making outside referrals if need be. We have our social emotional lessons um, that are taking place in the classroom with the teacher as well as the counselor. We have had tremendous support from Ms. Mason, our EC director, um, with some specific needs that we've had, as well as really focusing on that multi-tiered um, system of support. So like we tier our support, right? So it's not a one and done, it's not, oh, you've done this, this is what happens. So looking at the whole child, the whole program, and making sure that we're offering that support to the student, to the teacher, to the parent, bringing in that outside resource. So just looking at the whole, everything, the whole child, the whole system. Um, capturing kids' hearts, and then again, referral for school, school groups or outside resources. So our counselor does school groups based on student need, and then we also make referrals to outside resources. We've currently had 62 students with six or more absences. I know that looks like a lot, but I do want to share, you know, with flu going around, COVID, strep throat, those things. Um, that's why that number has, has increased this time. And, you know, we want kids in school, but with a set, right, for everyone involved. And what is being done to address the attendance issues? Again, we do the referral to the counselor. We have um, attendance letters that go out. We hold attendance meetings. Um, we conference with the parents. If there's any transportation issues or concerns, we address those and you know find a way to support the family. If it's not something we can do inside, inside the school, then we reach out to an outside agency um, to see how we can support. Okay. So that is all I have. Do we have any questions? Ms. Bridgers, I have a question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Joni. I was just curious. I know last year we talked about um, MTSS and we said we were just now starting the process. I'm curious where we are with that. How are we using data to be able to start to get that program going? And how are we using that data to drive instruction to really hone in on the standards to support the students that they need most? So what we are currently doing, Ms. Liverman, we have the, um, the performance matters and the early warning system that we use. And currently our MTSS coordinator and myself, we go through and we identify the kids that are pinging red for us, I guess you could say. Um, and we look at the attendance, we look at the academic part, we look at the behavior part. Um, and that is based off of the criteria that we determine as a school level team to say, okay, if the child has this many office referrals, it's gonna ding red. You know, if they have scored this academically, it's gonna ding them red. If they've had five or more absences, it's gonna ding them red. And so once we pull those students out, we look at them individually to see, are they already um, receiving support from the MTSS coordinator? Are they receiving support from the tutor that we have? Do the students have an individual um, reading plan and what that looks like? And then we go from there based on each individual student. And if there's something else that we feel we need to add based on that student's data, then we go in and add that as well. And then once we've applied those interventions and we've tracked them in ECAP, then we have the data and we can call the parents in and say, this is what we have, this is what we put in place, this is what we feel we need to do moving forward. But that's been a collective effort at the school level to determine you know, what those things are as well as we've worked on what the standard response protocol should be for those students. And then it becomes that individual looking. 
So it's, it's a lot of looking at the data once you've come up with the data points and the criteria. Awesome. And do you think that our and I know that, you know, our teachers have a lot on our plate. There's a lot going on in our school systems now. Are they feeling more comfortable with using this type of data in their classrooms on a daily basis to formulate groups, to have um, small group instruction, just really focused on using data that we have to drive instruction in the classrooms? So I will tell you that we as the instructional leadership team still do the biggest lift for that because our teachers do have a lot on their plate. However, they are part of those conversations in PLCs. Um, when we have those PLCs, um, if the teacher has concerns or questions about certain students, they can come to us and we convene together as a team for that. So, but the individual reading plans and the other things are already mapped out. So we can, you know, share with the teacher, this is what needs to be done. This is what intervention needs to be done. And then that is tracked through progress monitoring with Dibbles or with the growth checks through iReady. And it automatically populates in the system. So we can see that. So we still do the heaviest lift with that. And then we have our tutor as well as our MTSS coordinator as well as our TAs doing the um, interventions for the groups of students. So the teachers only have to do the interventions if it's a last resort or if that child needs an extra dose, if that makes sense. It does. I was just thinking about also with tier one instruction, like how are we utilizing that, but we might not be there yet either. Um, yeah, so we, I appreciate all the support. Yeah, so we, um, we are right now, we are focusing on that core. So like we've had the conversation that we can't intervene our way out of core. So you can talk to any teacher at TES and they're going to tell you we are focused on using iReady. That is our core. Um, we work with them on the lesson analysis and the standards deconstruction as well as annotating the lessons in iReady. And so we have started tracking when we go into the teacher's classroom what that looks like as well as doing practice clinics around that as like many PD for what specific teachers need. So we do that not as an I got you, but here, let me support you some more. I'm going to differentiate for you as I ask you to differentiate for our students every day. I love that. Thanks, Ms. Bridgers. Are there any other questions for Ms. Bridgers? Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Dr. Tripp with Columbia Middle School. Good evening, everybody. I'm Dr. Tripp, Columbia Middle School. So here again are our SIT goals. Increase office referrals by 15%. You see 15%, 60% uh, increases in math and 80% increase in reading achievement scores. And that is, of course, until 2026. So we still got some time. Our second quarter NC check in, we'll start with ELA. Uh, students were assessed in textual evidence, main idea, reading comprehension, understanding the key points in text, inferences, and characterization. If you look right here, you'll see that this is sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade together. Um, for the mean total percentage, they are within six percentage points, which is well within a good standard. So we're having consistent sort of behavioral output between the three grade levels, which is really important. So we're not seeing high deviations and changes there. But if you look at the micro data, you can see obviously seventh grade excelled in language, while sixth grade did much better in reading, while eighth grade did ready for reading for information. So there are some things that need to be fixed in the micro sets, but as an overall approach, the students are acting together. In mathematics, um, here we have the total mean correct is 35, 35, and 38. So again, they're still within that same quadrant of acting together, but of course, you have three different grade levels. They're measured in geometry, reaching of portions, number systems, expressions, functions, and data analysis. Data analysis is, of course, not just data analysis, but you know, everything you need with most deviation, et cetera. So with geometry with eighth grade, we have 23 ratio of proportions for sixth and seventh grade, which are similar. Also a number system here, we have 27 and 36. 
4, 6, and 7th grade again. Expressions of 6, 7, and 8. From 28 to 33, obviously, we're still within that beautiful 10 point range, which is what you actually want, and they're still there together with functions at 46% in math. And so those are our, of course, averages. Science check in our total score is 60, covering ecosystems, evolution, and genetics, molecular biology, structure, and function of living organisms. And right here we have an average of 61 for ecosystems and everything else actually being above 50%, which was nice for science scores. And that was really a wonderful outcome. Our behavioral data we have uh, in 2022, 23, we had 126 incidents in the first semester. This semester we had 65 incidents with a decrease of almost 50%. The top disruptive <coughs> highest incidences were disruptive behavior, and then there was a three way tie. <laughs> Love middle school between aggressive behavior and disrespect and inappropriate language and we can all see how those just roll into each other um, what was being done to address these incidences we had suspensions and discipline meetings parent student conferences and we uh, increased our you know social emotional learning classes and sometimes small meeting groups and capturing kids hearts model we went over that a lot in december november and january which was really necessary to struggle points before holiday break and after holiday break <laughs> Um, how many students have six or more absences? We have 40 students right now. And what's being done to address the attendance issues? We have our school council and administration meetings with parents, student meetings also. So what are our big strengths and what does it say to be? This is what's important to us right now. Um, our strengths, English 6 went from 17% to 44% of the students above 50%. Scoring above 50%, so this whole thing's about that, going from 17 to 44%. English 7 went from 12% to 42%, scoring above 50%. Math 6 went from 3% to 24%, 21% growth there. Math 7 went from 5% to 15% to 10% growth. English 8 went from 16% to 54%. And that's above 50%, which is a very strong indicator. And then our science 8 increased from 22% to 62%, with five students scoring above 90% with one perfect score. So we are seeing exceptional growth in the middle school with decreases in discipline and with the uh, student performance outcome. I do it measured in two different measurements, which is this is my method, which is how I was trained, and it, of course, is working as of right now. What are the three opportunities for improvement? The school has identified improvement to instructional quality for math and ELA. Obviously, if you're only getting um, 5 to 15% in math 7, obviously things need to change because we need that number to be much higher. Can't can't stay can't, you know, 15 percent is not good enough. Um, 42 percent is not good enough. 44 percent, 24 percent, those aren't really what we want to be. We want to be higher. That's what we push that. Um, conduct regular data meetings with students. This is the key point here. We're <coughs> in two parts. One, what are the teachers doing? The second, what are the students doing to get those growth points? So we look at student behavior also. Um, and so that's where we have the data meetings with kids and how they internalize their data, how they feel about it, how they feel about the school, do those temperature checks because without them, you're going to have terrible scores. The administration will continue to give regular feedback and coaching through daily walkthroughs. Um, we're still doing about 15 to 20 walkthroughs a week, giving teachers regular feedback, if anything's irregular, and trying to get those small things picked up on. So when they're doing small group construction, I'll observe the small groups that they're not in to see where we can find some fixes. What are your next steps? We're gonna work on identifying gaps in PLCs and address them during I &E time. Um, so whatever learning gaps we see, whether student behavior or teacher behavior, we're going to address those during I and E time to fill those slots in. The team working with NCDPI care centers to address critical need locations and areas. They have been exceptionally helpful in finding just things that need to be fixed. Sometimes you don't know what you don't know, and someone else does. Listen, and then make quick adjustments. All of those are important. Complete and see really adapt current teacher strategies for higher student achievement. Remember, we are in the business of teaching and learning, and that has to be proven. And so student outcomes are, of course, the standard. And that's all. Any questions for me? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to ask you. Any other questions? I was going to ask you a question. I was going to ask you how you're utilizing the NTS. NTSS is kind of tricky because it's a multi-tiered system of supports. So you have to look at all the different tiers. If you just look at the teacher and that patient and miss the student, student behaviors, then you're going to miss a whole fifty percent. The student portion, of course, is in behavior and academics. So if you the theoretical um, measurements that currently exist in education sometimes skip out on what the students are doing. So I've adapted 
um, some unique behavioral measurements from economic um, from behavioral economics based on rational and irrational information and percentages. And then I apply those into individual classrooms, and then from there I use those metrics to help the teachers address certain needs. Because it is middle school and irrational behaviors are key. So <laughs> it's just it's just something that we have to do. So I'm just gonna be honest with you, uh, that's why I use in TSS, I use the mathematical formulas. I don't base it solely on just uh, just the output data alone. It has to be one of the measurements. Thank you. Dr. Tripp, I have also had a question. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, you're running away too quick. I was just curious with that growth, what do you attribute that the success of your school building to? What are the things besides your teachers? Because I know we have awesome teachers in our school district, but what are some things that you attribute the growth to? Um, what's important to understand first and foremost is that we didn't change teachers. So let's automatically have and get that point out on the ground. Is that the same teachers you had last year with those same numbers, the growth, or the same ones you had this year with the increased growth. So literally the only thing that changed was how we were looking at the students. Um, and then of course applying standard teaching <coughs> measurements. So because we actually haven't fully done the job yet, we actually haven't finished growing. Because we're still building lesson plans, because we're still internalizing lesson plans, because we are still trying to establish standard basic behaviors from both the students and the teachers that are consistent day to day, the growth hasn't stopped. Only when the baseline uh, behaviors exist and exist in a continuum, whereas I don't have to continually address them and they exist, then you can begin with growth and proficiency monitoring, but until we hit 80% across the board and behaviors are standardized, then you can begin actually doing increases to create you know, better student outcomes. Um, and that's really important. It's nothing actually special. It's just doing basic education. We just haven't gotten to the baseline yet. We're still about 40% there. We have about 60 more percent to go to get to the base. And then only then after that, then you can start doing growth measurements. Any other questions, Matt? Thank you, Dr. Tripp. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Next up, this is Brianna Williams from Columbia Early College High School. Wow, I am so excited. Um, I could not do my job and do it well without the two of you. Um, so thank you, Mary. Thank you, Robert. Um, you could have three. <clears throat> more drastically different leaders in one school. We <laughs> <laughs> well together as we all talk about each other. That's nice to see you just like I just think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I have a lot of great news to share with you, so that's why I'm up here beaming with pride. Um, you know how high schools work. Instead of having one school year, we actually have two school years within a year. And a lot of people forget that. We have a, a start and a stop in the fall, and then we have a start and a stop in the spring. So we really get a chance to have different cohorts of kids, different classes, take our data from the fall and regroup and refine and prepare for the spring. So we have just started our spring semester, but this is based on the second quarter and fall semester. As I told you in my previous presentation, we had to increase the percentages on our school improvement goals, which is always great. English 2, this is the mean correct, let's see if I can find my pointer. Right here is the mean percentage of questions correct for check-in A and check-in B, and this is the EMC proficiency. Okay, so you're not really comparing the mean correct to proficiency, but this kind of shows you a cross-section. So in language, we increased from check-in A to check-in B. In reading for literature, we saw an increase. In reading for information, we saw an increase. Um, our EOC percentage was 36.36%. We still have a cohort of English 2 students this spring. Last school year, our proficiency was 34.5%. So we've already increased that by two percentage points. Okay, to tell you about the English 2 content standards, for the K-12 extended content standards for North Carolina, there are 38 pages of content standards. 
Okay, so somehow in high school, we have to figure out in English 1 and English 2, which teach the same standards, how to incorporate those standards in our lessons so that each student has the breadth and depth of that content and we do it in 90 days. Okay, Math 1. Math 1 is super exciting this year. We had 15 students take the Math 1 exam in the fall. Our proficiency was 66.7%. Last school year, the ending proficiency was 25%. To show you what huge gains this is across the state, Math 1 scores are predictably low um, in high school because a lot of your high-functioning math students, your high-level math students, take Math 1 in the 8th grade. So by the time you get to high school, you've kind of already, you know, segregated who's taking math one in middle school versus high school. So in Carroll County, we have 67% of our students in ninth grade that are taking math one as proficient for the fall. Okay, math three. My math three teacher thinks that she is writing the Carroll County School textbook. <laughs> right, Mr. Brick out. <laughs> she joked with me all the time. Um, her proficiency, she knocked out the park in the fall. She was 82% proficient. And to tell you about Math 3, Math 3 is a very rigorous math course. Uh, we also have our teachers sitting here in the, in the room. You've got to know that you're building from elementary to middle school to high school. When you get to Math 3, it qualifies for Math rigor and other accountability. Okay, so she's got 14 out of 17 of those students that were proficient. Like check-in A and check-in B, we saw an increase in number and quantity. Keep in mind there's different numbers of questions on check-in A and check-in B. Functions, geometry, statistics, and probability. And then her proficiency was there on the bottom. Okay. Um, for those of you that are old like me, these are the math three standards. Expressions, operations, and polynomials. Creating equations that describe relationships, equations and inequalities, functions, linear, quadratic, and exponential models, trigonometry, congruence, geometry, and statistics and probability. So if you ask me if Columbia High School students can handle the rigor of math and be prepared in a career, military, um, or college or university, do they have the ability to solve problems? Absolutely. Okay, so we are preparing our students. Biology, biology data is a little bit skewed. Um, last year, 2022-2023, we had 33.5% proficiency. If you'll notice, uh, check-in one, the check-ins were 61%, 47% uh, in molecular biology, 50%, 39% in structure and functional living things. Our overall proficiency was 25%. Last fall, we only had eight students to take the biology USC. This is kind of our gap year. We're moving biology from being a 10th grade course to being an 11th grade course in hopes that the score is improving and having one more year of science rigor to improve that percentage. All right, first quarter um, data analysis and reflection. What are three strengths that we have identified? Proficiency in math, one was 67%. Math three was 82%. The mean percentage questions correct increase from check-in A to check-in B, English 2. Uh, language and reading for literature continue to increase in check-in A and check-in B. We still have a lot to do with reading for information. What are three opportunities for improvement that we have identified? Reading for information proficiency and mastery in English. Overall proficiency in growth in English. Okay, we know the ability to communicate, to read, write, think. Um, and to understand what we're, we're reading transfers to every aspect of our life. So we want to increase that proficiency and growth for our students. Okay. Overhaul of biology for next school year. We're going to have a lot more sections. We're going to have at least three sections of biology. So we want to make sure that that um, course is a strong course by creating and developing standards aligned lesson plans and high quality assessments. So we want to get our science course up to where our math scores are. We need to continue this proficiency and growth trend for the semester in Math 1 and Math 3 for our spring semester students. And if we are, then we're going to be on target to beat last year's scores. And what are our next steps? Continue to grow capacity within our PLCs for unpacking the standards, data analysis, plans for reteaching and small group instruction, 
plan and execute the math boot camp for math one students in spring math and English tutoring enrichment and use ingenuity to support core instruction. Also, we are still um, building the plane as we fly it for their MTSS interventions and tiers of support. Our discipline and attendance data. Um, discipline referrals are at 179 office referrals. That's a combination of 67 ISS assignments and 36 out of school suspension assignments. The top two incidences were disruptive behavior and tardiness and skipping, also the repeat offenders category. Okay. What is being done to address these incidents? Capturing kids' hearts, uh, teacher and administrative interventions, parent contact, following the discipline continuum, a tiered consequences and support. We now have the RPLC up and running and introduction <coughs> trades program. And let me tell you, some of our students have had behavior issues and did not thrive in the regular academic environment or thriving in the introduction trades program. And they are developing handful of skills to make them career ready when they leave us. So it's very exciting um, to walk through and see them applying skills in welding, HVAC, refrigeration, and electrical trades. How many students have six or more absences? We wiped the slate clean. We started a new semester. All the students that were getting FFs have a passing score from last semester, but did not get the credit because of attendance. Um, we still do give them opportunities to make that time up, but it's on that student to make that time up so that we can restore that credit. Um, what's being done? Power school regular calls, teacher contact with families, we send home letters, um, we meet with social worker and counselors, home visits, um, and then we give an opportunity to them to make up. Now, on Friday, we have the Kyra VA Music Performance Group. As part of our Black History Month presentation, they are from Senegal and Pittsburgh, North Carolina. We've heard some great things about them um, from the elementary and then our band classes today. They're going to be in middle school tomorrow. For the world history classes Thursday and Friday at 10 o'clock, we're going to have their presentation and performance in the auditorium. So we're super looking forward to that. We're also going to have our Black History program, which the public is going to be invited to on February 23rd at 1130. The focus is going to be on the 20th century and the Harlem Renaissance. And also, we're going to introduce our kids to a lot of local black history to the five counties around, Terrell County and five counties surrounding us. Okay. Um, also, today I received a phone call that we have been given um, a very generous donation of local choir roads. So, we're going to be getting those hopefully in the next week or so. So, we're very excited about our music program, our art program, our STEM program and provide an opportunity for all of our students. Do you have any questions? I have a question. Could you refresh our memory on, um, because we do have this two semesters, how will they come up with our proficient school, our EOC score, so they just take the first, the ball? They're combined at the yeah. end of the year. Okay. So, so this would be like unofficial preliminary data okay. for the fall. And then, you know, our teachers get really good at trying to, to navigate their, their student growth, um, but that's not made official until like next October. Right. I just, I, the high school's always different because of the two semesters, and that's what I was trying to figure out. So there's an opportunity to still increase this. Yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Um, thank y'all for the school reports. Next up is our director presentations, and the first one is the help desk asset management system with Mr. Jacob Briggs. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jacob Brickhouse. I am the newest technology technician for the district. Um, and Dr. Roseboro asked me to give a short, um, informative presentation on our new asset management and help desk platform. Um, our team did a lot of research and shopping around for what would be the best fit for our district. And I'm very pleased to say what we felt was the best fit was also the most affordable. And the company that we chose to go with was one-to-one -one plus 
They are based out of Spartanburg, South Carolina. Um, and a lot of the programs that we looked at were really tailored toward bigger organizations and technology. Um, and this specific company that we chose is built by educators. So that, and it's tailored very specifically to the need that we have in education. Um, it's a scalable software solution, so it'll serve small districts like us all the way up to the Charlotte, Mecklenburg, and bigger districts. Um, and I, I will say that uh, technology technicians throughout the state are part of different forums, and this is a very popular platform. They also boast unparalleled support that is based in the U.S. I hope to not ever have to find out, but it does give me a little bit of peace of mind knowing if we have to call them, they're kind of just right up the road. So, um, This system will serve two, two main features for us. One will be asset management. Um, and my presentation is slightly tailored towards technology, but uh, we also have plans to use this system for, for other things for the district. Um, so we'll be able to track and manage all of our devices and technology assets in one single system. And what's really cool to me is we'll be able to track history. So is this device, what's wrong with this device? We can look and see back, oh, well, this screen has been cracked on this thing before, or, you know, was this device taken care of by the previous person? Who had it before? So user assignment. Um, were any fees charged to the student? Did they, did they break it several times, uh, et cetera? We'll also be able to conduct audits based off of each site. So when did we purchase these devices? When did we purchase these assets? Are we coming up on needing to buy some more stuff, right? Uh, as most of you know, technology, you got to keep refreshing it, right? And so what funding source did we purchase it from? Is this something that uh, we can do in the future? Um, and we're also looking in to manage non-tech uh, assets as well, such as family equipment, furniture, et cetera. The, the next part that it will facilitate for us is the help desk platform. Um, the way that we're currently operating is as you walk down the hall, Mr. Brickhouse, I need to see you. Um, we get a lot of emails every day um, and phone calls. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? We're a very small district, um, as, as Dr. Graham alluded to before, you know, it works for us. But at the end of the day, I will tell you, I'm just a human being. Uh, and I, I'm only going to speak for myself right now, but I know sometimes when I walk down the hallway, I'm on a mission, right? And before I can get where I'm going, sometimes I'll have four people stop me. I have the best intention of doing everything that was just asked of me. But Sometimes I forget, right? The beauty of this system is once somebody puts a ticket in, it's there and it doesn't go anywhere until I close it out or, or a technician on our team closes it out. Um, and just a little bit about me, I'm the type of person, like I can't stand notifications on my phone. So knowing stuff is stacking up really grinds my gears. So this will allow <laughs> us to kind of prioritize, you know, uh, what are the needs for our district? Uh, and even more importantly, for me being able to document the work that we do so that when I come to Dr. Roseburn and say we need another technician, I'll have the data to back that up. Right? <laughs> and so, anyway, um, and so just to give you, we, we don't have it set up quite yet. So just to give you somewhat of an idea of how it'll work for staff members is we're going to put a link on the website and they'll be able to click that link and sign in with their Google accounts. And once they get into the system, there's going to be different forms based off of, well, what need do you have? Is this a Chromebook repair? The things that I need to know are very specific for each repair, right? So Chromebook repair, what kid had this device? You know, and once they, once the teacher puts in that asset number, all that's going to populate for them. And that's really going to help our team out. Um, also, is it a staff device? You know, uh, general technology needs, is this a projector, a TV? You know, the endless supply is a website that needs to be unblocked. So there's different things that I need to know. And based off of what you have an issue with, you'll click that specific need and fill out that form. Once you hit enter and it comes through the system, we'll get, the team will get an email notification letting us know um, that, that there's a, 
an issue. An important thing to note is all those things that I mentioned before, walking down the hall, um, getting the email, uh, phone call, a lot of times that's either only coming to me or only coming to Wes or even the maintenance technician, Bruce, Andre, um, and sometimes they're the only one that knows about that need, right? And so when this, when, when a teacher does a ticket or a staff member does a ticket, it sits there and we can all see it. So we're all aware of the issues that are going on. Um, and so it's really nice. You'll get email notifications. Let's say, well, I don't want to keep having to sign back into this help desk system to know what's going on with my issue. As, as we update the ticket for you, you're going to get email notifications. And then not only that, but um, if you respond to those notifications, it updates the ticket for us as well. So very nice email notification and also ticket routing and automation. So for example, right now, I primarily cover the elementary school. Wesley, our other technician, primarily covers the middle school and high school. And based off of where the ticket is submitted, it can automatically be routed to the technician at that site. If in the future we need to restructure how our department does things, we can make it to where if it's uh, unblocking a website or adding a student to a program, those specific tickets would get routed to the technician who can best handle that need. But then if somebody's not there, all we got to do is check the system and we know what's going on. Um, and the last thing is custom reports. And so, again, the data. Be able to hit, hit you with the data of what, what are the big ticket items, what are the needs for our district. A couple other noteworthy features I wanted to mention to everybody is for the technicians, there is an app that goes along with this platform. So as the tech, our technicians are in the schools, um, if we see a device that's just laying around and it doesn't have any markings on it, well, who does this device belong to? We can quickly whip out our phone, see who this asset belongs to. Um, and we can even, you know, most of the time, if you wanted to check out a device, we have to have a scanner and a computer and you know there are times we need to do one-offs you know maybe we have a kid who just joined in the middle of the year you want know, to go grab something for that just flip out my phone check the device out to the student and keep it rolling also for help desk when we're in the school uh we'll be able to just take out our phones and check our tickets um, so it's really nice in that regard also parts inventory uh so consumable parts screens for computers, keyboards, mice, I mean, the endless supply of things that, that break and hit them, right? And so we'll be able to have a parts inventory that we can keep uh, track of everything. And the nice thing about that is it all even has where we can set it up to where when our parts inventory gets below a certain threshold, it'll email us, let us know, hey, you need to order more screens or more keyboards or whatever. And so, it's a, it's a really nice system. We're very much looking forward to implementing it in the district. And um, does anybody have any questions? I will before you ask any questions. I did include the link up here and in the assembly. And so if you want to check it out, they have a very nice website. And um, I think it's going to be a great addition to our arsenal for the district. Any questions? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I heard you mentioned mention maintenance. Is this also going to do work orders for those types of things, or is it just computer or technology related? That was one of the stipulations for the platform that we chose is it needed to be able to not only serve us, but serve our maintenance department if they so chose to do it. I think we decided to go forward with that, Mr. Langford. And so it will not only serve us, but our maintenance department. And, and I, as I mentioned uh, before, this cloud will also be used for different assets and so not just technology assets, but furniture, main equipment, the whole gamut. So. And what's the timeline implement the implementation timeline? We don't have it yet. We okay. just we just got done with the purchase process okay. and we're currently uh, scheduling the implementation call, hoping for hopefully either sometime into this winter or next week. Any other questions? Thank y'all.
I'm sorry, my computer decided to shut down, so please bear with me. <laughs> um, next up is the 2024-25 school calendar with Dr. Bruce Gordon. <laughs> So at our last board meeting, we provided an update on where we were with gathering our information in terms of putting together um, the 24-25 calendar. And we developed this calendar with various um, input from parents about our calendar and our work days being different. It was hard for them to maneuver their schedules as parents. We also met with our teacher advisory group to talk about our upcoming textbook um, training dates on top of letter dates. And could we possibly make sure that if we had training this summer, that we not touch month of July. So we knew what we had, um, what we were up against during this process because we were trying to develop a calendar that was balanced for elementary, middle, and high school and also try to please the masses with different feedback that we have received throughout the course of this school year. And we tried, we did the best that we could do this year. And I think that now that we have met with all of the groups, including our instructional leadership team, central office team, and we even had our attorney's office to look at our calendar because calendar is a hot topic right now across the state of North Carolina and some districts have decided to defy the calendar law. We were advised not to do that, that we had enough instructional hours that we could create a win-win for Terra County schools, making sure that staff started and ended at the same time. And so when we heard that, we said, well, let's, let's look at this, let's get this together and get it as balanced as we possibly could, knowing that we're gonna have a new um, student information system coming up in 20, 2025. We wanted to be sure that professional development needs could be covered at the beginning and the end of the school. So with that being said, um, our general statute requires that we have a total number of teacher work days for teachers employed during a 10 month period, and it should not exceed 195 days. Um, 11 holidays must be accounted for, a minimum of 10 annual leave days is required for spring and winter break. 185 instructional days or uh, 1,025 instructional hours must be obtained in the school year. And student start date must start closest to August 26th and end um, the Friday closest to June 11th. So with that being said, um, we're going to start with what we did with Columbia Early College High School Day. It's important to put the disclaimer out there that because our high school has one student number, it is one school, which means we, could, we cannot start half of the school at a different time than the other half. They have to start at the same time. So our school day is from 7.50 to 3.05, so that's about seven and a half hours. So we already knew we were banking time in terms of instructional hours. So when we start looking at the calendar, we knew we could get the 11 holidays, the 11 annual leave days, but we knew that the early college had to start early. And we know that we have shared staff with the middle school. And it was causing a nightmare for finance because they had some employees that were starting and stopping at different times and the middle school still needed staff. But staff was not okay, always available. Staff was leaving for board the designated time. So we looked at making sure that we had the 14 required teacher work days, the four optional teacher work days, and that was a total of 18 days, 162 full student days, and 13 early release days because they're getting out at one o'clock for their exams. That gave us 175 instructional days. And that uh, required us to bank 1,105 hours, which put us over the instructional time. We also accounted for transition time during the day because our students go to school seven and a half hours a day or more in some cases. We were able to take off and shave off the transition.
transition time. We got it down to six and a half instructional hours, 162 full student days. That came up to um, 1,053 hours. And then the four instructional hour days times 13 early release days, that gave us 52 hours. So our total number of hours, we were able to gain time. So we're over what's required by the general statute. We must have 215 days within the fiscal year for our schools. And we met that criteria by calculating up all of the work days. And so we now have a balanced calendar for Columbia Early College High School. With TES and CMS, again, there's, they start school early and end late, so we were making time there to meet the instructional hours. We have the 22 work days, as we did for the early college. We have 13 required work days and six optional work days that gave us 19 work days. We have 170 full student days, four early release days, and that put us at 174 instructional days and a 1,121 hours. So we were over, over the number of instructional hours that's required by the general statute. We have 193 teacher work days. Remember that we cannot exceed 195 days for 10, 10 month employees. We got it balanced at 215. So both schools have the 215, including 12 months employees for the fiscal year. And we did not exceed the 195 days required for teachers. So we don't have to spend any additional money bringing staff back for professional development early or keeping them later in the year for professional development. Because of the uh, hours that we go to school currently, we were able to bank time and save money um, with this particular calendar. So um, I'm going to go to the calendar. And I want to give Ms. Curls a shout out. We have heard nothing but praises about the way that the calendar looks. Um, we, we only had eight comments during our public comment period where people wanted to voice their concern. But other than that, we've gotten phone calls about how did y'all do that? How, did, how are you able to get that calendar so balanced with 215, 215? and make sure staff start and end at the same time. Well, it was no easy feat. I feel like it was a workout. And, and we kept calling each group. We had our principals to also talk to staff and everyone had the opportunity to come in on the calendar. But Ms. Curls made it happen. I said, can do you think you could just get us one calendar? Listening to the feedback from my parents and parent advisory, we just need one calendar. And so I'm just so thankful that Audrey went out there, start researching other school districts and just the format of how everyone else is doing the calendars. And she came up with this beautiful blend for our families to put on their refrigerators so that they just have one calendar to look at and we have the symbols. Um, and so I know for the early college, we got some feedback um, about them only having two work days prior to school starting. Well, they really have three. If they take the optional work day, they have three days ahead of time. And Ms. Uh, Williams has already stated to staff, she's going to open her building that first week in August. So if people want to come in to work, we just can't pay you to come in to work. But if they want to come in and set their rooms up, she's gonna have the building open for her teachers and um, anyone else that wishes to get in there like maintenance that may need to get in there as well. But the students have to start on the 15th um, because BCCC starts on that date. So the elementary student, I mean, the elementary teachers will have the bulk of their work days at the beginning of the school year. And the early college will have the bulk of their work days at the end of the school year. And um, I remember previously we wanted to make sure that staff was working that Friday the day before and the Friday to prepare for graduation. That had always been an issue at the high school where staff would leave and then you'd have to bring them back to prepare for the graduation or they would leave early and not come to the middle school for testing. And we need everybody for our testing. We have to retest and remediate. So with this calendar, we'll be able to use 
additional staff to support middle school testing and elementary testing um, because we have multiple mod groups for our EC students. So this will be helpful for all three of our schools um, in that way, and it gives them enough time to concentrate on the professional development needs and things that they're going to roll out from the state. Our middle school teachers are going to have to start letters training like our elementary friends have had letters training. It will be a middle school model, and they're going to need these days at the end of the year to be able to concentrate on their training for um, reading to learn. So throughout the calendar, we also, another big win that I want to highlight is the two weeks for Christmas break. I heard that over and over. I don't, I don't really care what the calendar looks like. I want a full two weeks. So a lot of people have said, why can't we have a week at Thanksgiving? Well, we can't have a week at Thanksgiving because then we unbalance another set of days that we're required to have for annual leave and holidays. So that was kind of hard to do to get the week at Thanksgiving and get a full two weeks for the holiday Christmas or your holiday break or your winter break in the winter months. But we made it happen. So one of the questions that came into the survey was, why are we coming back to school so late in January? Well, we're coming back late in January because of the way that the holiday falls of this upcoming year. And folks really wanted the two weeks. So we were able to get that in there as well. Um, for April, uh, the team also wanted a, I believe, uh, early release day in April. One of our committees wanted that, and we were able to get that in for April 2nd. And we were able to preserve the spring break as well. And for Thanksgiving break, we do have an early release day and then an optional work day, and then Thursday and Friday for Thanksgiving. And I believe those were some of the biggest issues with the calendar. Um, as far as our CTE hours, normally they're supposed to have 135 hours of coursework, and we cover that in the second semester. And for the first semester, what we plan on doing for the first semester is doing some extended learning time where we would be adding on that one additional hour for a week for problem-based learning because they have so many projects. So they're actually probably going to end up over 135 hours with project-based learning with some of these uh, project extensions they have to do with CTE. So we've covered that as well. Um, I would say we're all pretty pleased. I know we couldn't make everybody happy with the calendar. And I, I you know, I just, I'm thankful that we did our due diligence in making sure that we captured the voices from the field about what they didn't want. And so we had something to work with if we knew what was the non-negotiables, then we could go into this more balanced with a clear head. And I know that some folks are used to getting out early with their staff and coming back early, but now we have it balanced. And I think um, elementary folks, I know they looked at it and they will be appreciative in the end about they're getting their training done ahead of time versus having to stop and start and stop and start. This is a good balance for us all. Are there any questions? I have a question just to make sure I understand that currently. Mm -hmm. Our grade, the end of the grading periods, are we all consistent with those? Okay, that's that was one thing I was curious about. It just threw me off because in the December one, it's shaded blue, but I take it it means also elementary and middle school will end that grading period. On the 20th? They will end, yes, they're ending their grade period early. And they talked about that too. Okay, good. Um, okay. But it's because of the number of instructional hours they're already covered. Okay. I just want to make sure I was reading that correctly. Yeah. So, One of the big questions during this, and I think it's a big misconception when people do the calendars, is the balance between orders. And we had our attorneys to look in that. The statute does not talk about a balance between the quarters. You just have, that's why they put the hours in there. So you have enough instructional hours to justify why the quarters on that. Dr. Roseboro, since we have shared staff with middle school and high school, how does the work days impact that with having 
Um, some of them follow the elementary middle and then the others follow the high school. They're all on the same work days now with this calendar. I may not be understanding your question. And maybe it's the colors that are a little bit confusing for some of them. For instance, kind of calling out um, you scroll down. At the beginning and the end of the year? Yes, and then one was in December, but maybe that was because it was purple and that was optional. Not sure. Or blue in December. Yes, so December 16th through the 20th mm -hmm. with the circles, that's um, only elementary, correct? No, that's only high school. High school. Okay. So because that's only high school, how does that impact T E S C M S? Because that's only high school. Thinking about the shared teachers there. The blue is for the dismissal, Miss Liverman. It's the yellow we have to look at. Oh, right. But how many times in early dismissal do we have professional development sessions? Oh, we've had them. Every early release, they have had exactly. exactly. Um, with the with the early dismissal, it doesn't really impact shared staff because they still have to work a full day. It's early dismissal for students, not staff. Right. I guess maybe I'm not stating my question clear enough. I'm I'm mostly con mostly concerned about the <clears throat> seeing if I can word it a different way. I'm just thinking about the work days and making sure that our work days are coincided. I totally understand the beginning of the school year and the end of the school year, but looking at, let's look at May 23rd for instance, and that's up there. That's back to high school. And then can you scroll up to the legend, please? And that's the first and last day for students. Okay. My biggest concern was the work days and having our professional development options days for our teachers to not be different for each of the schools, if that makes sense. That, that was one of the things that we're most proud of with the calendar is that they have the same uh, work days and optional work days, except it's different at the beginning and at the end of the school year, but throughout the year, it'll streamline it for the parents. The early release day for our high school students, staff is still working. So for shared staff, um, it just depends on how the, the master schedule is ran if the CTE courses, because that's most of who we're sharing, are in the afternoon or in the morning. So in the very beginning, like August 19th through 22nd, that's a required teacher work day only for TES and CMS. Yes, ma'am. Because CHS is working. They're already working. Their kids are in school. Mm This is the first time the board has seen this. Hold on, we'll move to this till our work session that way. Because it is, I like the calendar. There's a lot of colors. <laughs> <laughs> you try to use yeah, the same colors. Everywhere. Everywhere. Oh, I can't remember the colors. I trust you, but I can't remember them. But yeah, I mean, this is the first time we've seen it. It takes a little while time to adjust it and, and adopt it then. So that way, you know, Ms. Liverpool can look a little bit better and the other questions we have. We'll try to get those answered. That's fine, but I do want to say publicly, it's been out there for 10 days. <laughs> and we do need well, to. I, have, I didn't see it. So, this budget package. I, last I week. just want to say that for my stakeholders, my parents that are on parent advisory and my teachers, I want to say that publicly that this has been out there for 10 days for public view. Oh, well, yeah, it just, comment. last meeting it had a different. We just different. talked about what decisions. We well, no, there was a different timeline. Well, we said by March, so we can. Yeah, wait. no, it was just a different timeline. It said we would be given it at this meeting, and then the ten days 
would be um, after we got the vehicle. I guess that's why I was looking for the As long as we have it, it before March, I think they can. I do commend y'all though for getting it all on one page and getting it both nice. legible and all that. So thank you for that. Don't Google. Okay. I'm at the motion to take the rules until uh, work session on the 17th. That's the 21st. There's been a motion made to table the review of the approval of the calendar until the work session for February. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, how do you vote, Mr. Scripture? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Liverman? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Um, Gibbs? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Dunbar? And I vote yes. The calendar approval has been tabled for our work session in February. <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation, Mr. Scripture. Mm -hmm. You're Next up is Dr. Roseburg with the proposed budget timeline. <laughs> so each year the superintendent um, is supposed to bring a proposed timeline to the board um, regarding um, the budget and it's supposed to be developed January 31st and then reviewed and approved by May 1st. And after our last board meeting, um, we talked about having some um, work sessions to look at the budget um, in chunks and so that we could be sure that we were making some informed decisions regarding the budget. So the following is the proposed um, timeline starting with September and October when we got our allotments and looked at our programming needs up into the board approving the budget resolution um, in January. So with that being said, we're a little bit behind with our budget timeline, but we are proposing that we start our budget work sessions um, at the next February work session, where we'll start off looking at our capital projects and streamlining our lottery funds um, and working with departments and schools in March. Um, working, we're currently working with staff on the needs based budgeting process where they are outlining their needs while also working on the current budget for the current school year. So they just got their budgets or about to get their budgets as departments and schools while trying to predict what their needs are for the upcoming school year. So we are working uh, simultaneously with two different fiscal years and I commend staff for doing that and having patience um, to do that because I know that's no easy feat and we are going to uh, work with our county commissioners on seeing uh, when, when they would like the budget letter um, sent in and we're hoping that we'll be able to send in that budget letter after our work sessions in March probably late March um, to give us enough time to evaluate our needs and then send in the request on behalf of the board based off of the needs that the board feels is necessary or what the ask should be of the county commissioners um, to make up any short times. So we are working diligently to ensure that we meet that May 1st deadline of preparing for the 24-25 school year. Are there any questions about the budget timeline process? Dr. Risborough, I appreciate um, this timeline. And one of the concerns that I have, I think we addressed this a little bit, but it was about, um, I've talked to the board chair and I've also briefly mentioned it to you, but talking about our teacher um, stipends. I know they normally have gone out in January, I believe. <clears throat> and I know this was a hot topic um, amongst our staff, which well, well, 
totally understood. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something that I would like to better understand where we are with that. Mm -hmm. And then also, um, what can we do in the future? Because it, this was not because of the board approving it in January. Our state board, our state budget was not approved until November. How can we advise our staff or what can we do to help bring awareness to staff so they are prepared for this um, in the future? I'm not quite sure because I don't think we were prepared for it from the state. Um, we, we have Could a memo go out from finance to say, hey, this hasn't been approved. This is going to impact X, Y, and Z. We did. We notified staff. An email went out and the principals communicated that the state budget was on hold, um, which was one of the reasons why they couldn't order all the supplies that they wanted um, because we were still operating off of an contingency budget. So I, I feel like staff did communicate with teachers to let them know that the budget was on hold. Um, maybe they didn't understand that that meant all, you know, refunding resources or additional resources um, from the state. Maybe that was the piece that they were not clear on. But now that the budget has been approved, um, Dr. Wright is going to come up and do the presentation on the timeline for the supplemental compensation and the uh, stipends that will be going out to staff. Yeah, I'm thinking it was probably not clear. I'm not sure that that would have been my first thought, to be honest, um, especially with, you know, teaching all day preparing. But I'm just wondering, you know, perhaps I'm not saying that this is the the end all be all, but just more transparency and and calling it out might might have been helpful. I don't know. All right, I'm going to send up Dr. Wright if that's okay, so she can um, go over the supplemental compensation plan, and they may add, answer some more questions for you. That'd be awesome. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Okay. So I think I'm ready. I just want Dr. Wright know if you're ready for that. Do, do you want us to approve the budget timeline? Okay. <clears throat> there is a um, consideration. It just says consider approval of the budget timeline. Is there a motion to approve the budget timeline? So moved. Ms. Um, Gibbs has made a motion to approve the budget timeline. Has there any um, discussion? Hearing none, how do you vote, Mr. Scripture? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Liverman? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Gibbs? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Dunbar? And I vote yes, the budget timeline is approved. Thank y'all for that budget layout. Thank you. And Dr. Wright, we'll turn it over to you for the supplemental compensation at the end. Okay, so I am going to present the um, supplemental teacher compensation. Um, there's a clicker, or you can use the over arrow. Either one. All right, so for this particular um, supplemental fund that is being paid 
Um, it is out of PRCL 71, uh, Supplemental Funds for Teacher Compensation Allotment provides funds to eligible local school districts for salary supplements for eligible teachers, as well as instructional support personnel. Uh, we are within a county that does have, um, that allows us to qualify for these funds. So Terrell County Schools is eligible for this year for the 23-24 school year. Um, state funds allotted to NPRC 071. We have received $278,607, $278, which covers supplements for 42 teachers plus um, FICA as well as uh, retirement contributions. Uh, the maximum amount that would be awarded to individual teachers, eligible staff, because it is instructional support personnel, would be $4,969 based on the uh, funding formula. <clears throat> the allocation of sub salary supplements among teachers and instructional support, whether a qualifying teacher or instructional support will receive a salary supplement, the amount of the supplement provided to that person. Um, so what I would like to do, uh, there is a method and a payment schedule that has been determined as well as there's alternative funds for those um, for pre-K and other teachers. <clears throat> the supplements will be distributed in two parts at the bottom there and the, with the first payment at the end of March and then the balance of in June after the last day of employment. And for this particular supplement, we are looking at 10 month certified employees, 11 month certified employees, and 12 month certified. Least um, teachers as well as instructional support have been identified. Um, and what I would like to do um, is actually send out a letter to um, those that will be receiving the supplement in regards to what their amount of the supplement will be and just in regards to the two different um, payments for um, for March and then the remainder in June. So that would be something that I'll probably be trying to work with uh, Ms. Simmons in regards to getting those uh, letters sent out maybe the first week of, of March. And just in regards to um, the state funded the amount of still see the 278. Okay. Okay. That's the last one. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? None of this can be used or worse. Why do you have to use what staff or anything like that? It's only for teachers and instruction staff. And we were only allowed 42 teachers, and we had to um, pull from other specific revenues to cover our other 2.85 uh, teachers that, that we have in our allotment. And the general statute is very clear. Oh, yeah. Lee, can you repeat your question? I couldn't hear us. <laughs> All right, I'm going to speak to the microphone and add your points to it. Jody, I was asking, was there any money allotted or could it be used to help support staff as well? Uh, and the answer was this allotment cannot be used for anything other than teachers and, and it's been allotted for support staff. Instructional support staff. You know, custodians, cafeterias, bus drivers, everybody. And it's my, it's my understanding this is also a smaller allotment than last year. Yes, that's correct. That's why we're making making up the difference with the uh, two point fifty five. That's because of our ADM. What's your allotment? The number of teachers that are right. We're we're paying for additional staff. <laughs> I have a question about it's prorated and applicable based on percentage of employment. Is 
that if they started in a year late with us, or is that based on if they took FMLA or something like that, or how is that determined? I know there's um, some people that's in there, so it's like a part time hour, so that's yeah. prorated for um, part time. Okay. They want to see the full amount. <clears throat> so that's why I'm definitely going to make sure we'll make it a little bit. I'm just wondering why is it honestly until the end of March that we talked previously about when we originally were thinking about utilizing the supplemental pay um, for the teacher attendance that plan on that policy 7500 stated the end of January and I believe May I'm, I'm just curious why are we pushing it out until the end of March because we're in the middle of processing payroll for February and we are a small staff and we are in the middle of working on getting budgets out for the current fiscal year and planning for the upcoming year. So we need time to process this payroll. And March is the earliest that we can get it done. Are there any other questions? Oh. Go ahead. I think that's just, I mean, I, I totally understand. I get that we're a small staff, but I think that with what our teachers do every day, and this is not something that is new. It's not like this was something new this school year. We've done this for years and years and years. I do think this should be a priority for our teachers, and it's something that we knew that was coming. So I'm, I'm not understanding why it's happening two months later. We were operating off of a contingency budget in January. So if any of the budget in December, are you saying that that would have that would have made the one month difference for us as a board approving the budget leads to two months of our teachers not getting their supplement? Yes, and the timing that it came in from the state. It could have possibly, it could have, it would have possibly been able to be done in the end of January or February, but we meet at the beginning of the month of January. Right, and you know, I feel like there's been a little bit of a blame game, not just not calling anybody out, but blaming the board um, for this. And I wanted to be very clear that, you know, I think we all, including the state, not this was not even brought up at our budget with the board in January. Um, I personally was under the impression based on the policy 7500 that our staff would still get the um, supplemental pay in January and March, I mean, May. So <clears throat> I guess I, I'm just, I was unclear that this was even an issue or needed to be taught about, talked about or voted on. And I don't know if any other board members felt the same or maybe I was just on an island by myself. But I do think, especially with morale, we've talked a lot about morale being low, like this should be a top priority for our school system. Go ahead. I received the notification from Ms. Simmons uh, that we received the, the compensation on January 31st. I, I, I was going to add to that. I'm not quite sure when the state dropped down this. Like, I don't know how that works with the state approving the budget so late. I, I'm not sure how all that works with the drop downs. 
this letter meant. I don't think it was, I think it was held up by the state at this point. It's my, I'm not saying that right, but I think how it was supposed to be paid the approved budget back in November. State sets down guidelines. I don't think anybody knew how much of my hard map was until January. Is that correct? That's my understanding, but it was also blamed on the board, our board, for not approving the budget, and that's what and that's what I want to make clear. But it is bigger than that. It's the state, and I don't think that our school system should play a blame game. I think we all work together. We should all work together. And I just wanted to make a point that I do think, even though this was at the end of January, it should be a top priority for our school systems to compensate our teachers. I don't have committed the payroll dates, but I assume that's what the March date is, is the March payroll so. Is there any other discussion about the supplemental compensation plan or questions? There's a recommended action at the bottom of the um, tab that the board approved PRC's 071 Supplemental Compensation Plan and payment date set for March 2024 before spring break and for June 2024 after school ends. Um, the total payment amount will not exceed the current teacher cap of $4,969. <laughs> the pleasure on the board of that action. Make a motion to approve the plan as presented. Mr. Scripture has made a motion to approve the plan as presented. Is there any discussion? I just want to say that um, I understand that we need to approve this to get our teachers paid, but I, I don't think that waiting until the end of March, I don't think that's acceptable for something that, that we knew was coming. I think it would be great to happen sooner than later, but I understand we need to approve this in order to get something rolling. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, how do you vote this for scripture? Yes. How do you vote this, Liverman? Yes. How do you vote this, Gibbs? Yes. I do vote Ms. Dunbar, and I vote yes. The motion has approved, has been approved for the supplemental compensation plan. Thank y'all for that presentation. Next up is our construction update with Mr. Murphy. Keep going, right? Okay. Hot and <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, just a little update on on our our biggest um, project. I guess we got going on is with the, the new learning lab. Um, y'all, I think y'all got a complete packet in y'all stuff, but just kind of hit some highlights. Um, on January 23rd, we did have a meeting that was two weeks ago from today, previous, um, and this is just the folks that were in attendance here um, this was um just a, a, a kind of a summary of what had been done what they were looking to get done in the upcoming work the work that had been performed was the, the brace that had been installed for the steel frame and they had started doing some site grading uh, the site grading was a uh, still still kind of a mess but it's, it's, it's still wet. So if y'all go over there, and I encourage all of y'all, y'all get a minute to go ahead and look at this. I would, we had another meeting today, so what y'all will see on these slides here is really, it's no need for looking anything like that now. Um, upcoming work that says they're going to complete the steel framing. They're installing the roof system. The roof is on the building. I've, I've seen it today in my own eyes. The roof is on it. 
Um, the masons to allow uh, to follow. The masons are in there. They've got quite a bit of the exterior walls up, quite a bit of the interior walls are up. Um, I walked through there today, just kind of walked through and looked, and it's, it's kind of mind blowing how fast it's moving. It seems like it took forever to get going. And now we got going, it's, it's moving pretty quickly. Um, it's just the plug, some of the plumbing pipes and stuff are already in the walls and different rough ends and stuff like that. So, um, like I said, y'all need to really go look at it. Get a, get a minute, walk over here, take a peek at it. This is um, some pictures of that was taken on the 23rd. And like I say, it looks totally different now. Um, this is just different views of it. Go ahead. We, we do have some issues, um, and I don't know exactly each one of the corners where the each corner post sits. We have some cracking of the concrete, as it's noticed here. Um, we did discuss that today and, and followed up on it. There was some control joints and it was left out. Uh, some issues with, with the, the contractor. The architect they are actually working hand in hand now to try to resolve these issues. So um, we're hoping that it's going to be resolved. Um, and that's just pretty much it right there. Just um, just the pictures put put together by Mr. Brad, um, and he came out today and looked at. But I can tell you, um, like I said, we had a meeting today that it's come along. The projected date being done is June the 20th, I think, um, is what we came up with today. The date is still the same. So it's coming along. It's coming along. It, it looks totally different than what it did two weeks ago. So in two weeks' time, we got a well, we did. I ain't done nothing. They have worked, they have worked, they have worked, on, they, they have worked on it pretty, pretty strong. So. But, there any idea what caused that concrete to crack and is it is, are those cracks starting to separate the the idea what i was told today the idea of it was because when they put the the upright beams up the wind and the movement of it the concrete without having a control joint there in each corner they say it's just, they're supposed to be just just something else they're looking into they say it's just a surface crack my question would be, has, has any of that six foot of sand underneath there moved due to all that rain? Because all, all you build away sits on this whole point. That's true. Uh, actually, and I think has, has six, all of that six sand and all that rain done something underneath that building and caused that set? The architect today said no, but I, I, that's all I got to go yeah. Nobody really knows. Well, I mean, it's, Nobody really it's knows. It's theirs until we. That's it. right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, you are correct. You are correct. But uh, like I say, the uh, architect and the they are testing that they are they are looking to uh, try to, to remedy this this problem along with a couple of little minor problems which you're going to have with construction. And we've had some wind. It is wind. It's still good over there. And we've had a lot of wind. But the roof's on is within uh, we're not gonna have another meeting for three weeks. And when we go back in three weeks, the, they're projecting that the, the outside walls will be finished, the metal will be on it, and be closed in. So that's what they're projecting. As long as the weather holds out, we don't get no crazy winter weather. Who knows? Any questions? Any questions about any other any other more problems? Maybe I can answer. Thank you, Mr. Yes, sir. Next up is the superintendent. <clears throat> Teacher working condition surveys will be released um, this spring, and so we have already participated in the open house um, to kind of look over the new, I guess there are new dimensions within the TWC, so there are going to be some new 
um, categories and wording. So it's the new and improved teacher working condition survey and our principals are currently working on their rostering of teachers um, to be sure that the teachers get the teacher working condition survey um, information in a timely manner. And we hope to have 100% participation. The Center for Safe Schools awarded uh, $35 million in school safety grants. Terrell County <coughs> Schools received $150,000. Um, we want to thank Officer Franks and Dr. Hodges uh, team, the student services team, for their input and help with the grant. Um, so we were able to secure that. Myra's not here um, this evening, but she was um, also awarded a grant for up to $50,000 for the North Carolina Innovative Breakfast um, Program grant. This will help her, help her with delivering breakfast in the classrooms at the high school, which is going very well. Kids are coming out, getting their breakfast, punching in their numbers, and even if they don't want the breakfast, they're coming out anyway to get it to help Ms. Um, Myra. So, I think that's very good and very promising. So now she's going to have an opportunity to get the grab and go kiosk um, for the high school and also get some additional equipment for um, TES. Um, Tracy's not here tonight, but we were also awarded a CTE modernization grant from the state. And I believe it was $25,000. We did not get the federal CTE modernization grant. Uh, we scored 80 points, and it was mostly due to our size as a district that we did get the federal grant between Hyde and Terrell. That's the one that we partnered on. But we did receive a state CTE uh, modernization grant. Um, the, new, the process for the North Carolina um, student information system is underway. Um, we do have about 20 school districts that are going to be in phase one and they're going to go live on 24-25. We will be going um, live in phase two um, with everyone else. So they'll be working out the kinks um, with those pilot districts. Um, and so we'll be training all along the way. Uh, next year to gear up with going live and it's supposed to be a one-stop shop. Um, Ms. Pearls has, has talked to us about how we will be saving um, money there as well because we won't have to pay for a separate call system um, because Infinite Campus will have a calling system. It'll have the enrollment suite. Um, it'll have our data dashboard attached to it and some other features that um, everyone thinks will be nice to have that across the state so that districts don't have to pay for a platform here, there, everywhere. And we will be working with Power School um, to work on what our roll-off will be from our current contract. Next steps is uh, we'll have our February and March um, finance and policy workshops as we talked about. And for March, uh, we will be bringing an update about remediation and retesting um, timeline. That was another reason why we, we hope to have the calendar approved so that come March, we can work on giving you an update on the timeline regarding summer programming, uh, remediation, and retesting dates. And uh, I think that's it. Important dates to remember, we have an early release date on February 15th. Um, the board work session will be on the 21st. On the 22nd, CMS will have a Black History Program at 2 o'clock p.m. February 23rd, uh, Columbia Early College will have their Black History Program at 11.30. And TES will have their Black History Program at 6 o'clock on the 29th. Are there any questions? It's also National um, Counselors Week uh, coming up next week, and uh, we want to be sure that we show all our counselors some love in um, our student services department. So we'll be celebrating them next week as well. And this is we love our teachers more, and uh, we also would like to show all of our teachers some love uh, for all of their hard work and dedication to public education. Thank you. Are there any questions for Dr. Oh, it's also Love the Bus Month. I forgot about Love the Bus. So we got the show. Mr. Ronnie and crew 
Um, some love as well, especially our bus drivers that are in dual roles, and we want to make sure that we show them some love too as part of um, we love our teachers and staff month. So we're just going to be spreading the love all the time for the month of February. We love y'all each and every day. Thank you. Thank you. Next up are our action items, and the first item we have is our consent agenda. And tonight we have one item on the consent agenda. It's the second reading of policy 5023, the net not seeing your can administration and schools policy. This has been um, already approved on first reading, so we just need the approval of the consent agenda for the second. Ms. Dunbar has made a motion to approve the consent agenda. Um, how do you vote, Mr. Scripture? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Liverman? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Gibbs? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Dunbar? Mm -hmm. And I vote yes. The consent agenda has been approved along with that policy 5023. <laughs> Next up is the approval of minutes. We have two sets of minutes this evening. We have um, January the 8th minutes from the board work session and um, January 16th. Um, 24 minutes from the board meeting. Ms. Robbins made a motion to approve the minutes from January 8th and January 16th. Is there any discussion about that motion? Hearing none, how do you vote, Mr. Scripture? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Liverman? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Gibbs? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Dunbar? And I vote yes. The minutes are approved <coughs> from January 2024. Next is the approval of personnel recommendations. Are you ready? Okay. Are they? Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Give us just a minute for technology. They are attached if you want to refresh. Mr. Scripture has made a motion to approve the personnel agenda as um, presented. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, how do you vote, Mr. Scripture? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Lumberman? I'm going to abstain since I wasn't able to read everything in closed session. Okay. How do you vote, Ms. Um, Gibbs? Yes. Yeah. 
Any of those no more? And I vote yes, the personnel agenda is approved. <laughs> that concludes our monthly meeting, unless there's anything else. Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? This gives made a motion to adjourn. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, how do you vote, Mr. Scripture? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Liverman? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Gibbs? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Delmar? Yes. And I vote yes. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for attending this evening. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a good night.